good afternoon or good morning, depending on where this broadcast finds you today. I'm going to let everyone get settled in virtually here before we we get started. It's great to see um, a few familiar names, and we may have a few more joining us here as we get ready to, to start today's uh, webinar. So great to see everyone. But I'm going to let just get a couple more minutes to get everybody settled in. It looks like uh, Kevin is still trying to get connected to audio. Okay, Kevin is in. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. <clears throat> well, I, again, I want to just welcome everyone to our Essential Substance Abuse Skills uh, webinar today. Uh, for November. My name is Steve Steine. I'm one of the managers here at our uh, American Indian Alaska Native uh, HTC National Center. Uh, I'm broadcasting to you today live from Billings, Montana. I'm involved in another uh, training and uh, teaching course uh, here in Billings. And uh, I also have with us our presenter today, uh, Avis Garcia, who is also in Billings. She's part of our the training we're doing here. So Avis and I are uh, trying to be in two places at once. Uh, this is a uh, this is a feat here. Um, but I I really am uh, happy to have uh, everyone on today. We've got a, a really uh, informative uh, and important um, topic today. Uh, we're we're going to continue. This is this is again connected to last month's uh, discussion, but today we're gonna to be talking about clinical evaluation, um, particularly focusing on assessment. So I have just a few uh, introductory slides that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and go through, um, and then I'll turn the floor over to Avis to begin today's webinar. Again, it's just, uh, it's great to see everyone, and I'm gonna see if I can move my bar up here. There we go. And I am, I'm operating today with one screen. So um, not having two screens is a little unsettling, but we're, we're doing the best we can. Again, I wanna welcome you all. Good morning or good afternoon. This is our Essential Substance Abuse Skills webinar. Um, and I have just a few introductory slides and then we'll get started. So welcome everyone. This webinar is brought to you by the uh, National American Indian Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. We are uh, part of a larger uh, network, including 10 regional centers, uh, a National Hispanic Latino Center, and a uh, coordinating office at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. <clears throat> this, uh, again, this uh, presentation is brought to you uh, by SAMHSA. Our center is funded uh, and supported by SAMHSA. Uh, the content of this event is created by the presenters and does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or the National American Indian Alaska Native HTC. Following today's event, uh, we will reach out to you via email and we will um, <clears throat> include links to today's slide presentation in PDF form We'll also uh, have a recording of this um, event available at our uh, archival website, uh, YouTube website, if you're interested. And I believe we'll include a link to that recording as well. We will offer CEUs per re by, by request. Um, 1.5 CEUs, uh, NADAC approved CEUs will be available for this event. If you are interested, just let let us know when you receive the follow-up email and we will get that certificate to you. And lastly, uh, I will be putting in the chat a link to a short survey 
you'll also have an opportunity to complete this short survey in the follow-up email. This survey is very important to us. It allows us to continue to provide um, webinars and events such as this at no cost. Uh, it's a short survey. You're not obligated to, to complete it, but we would appreciate your feedback. You can skip any questions you would like, and none of the information can be linked to you in any way, so it's private and confidential. If you have any questions about that survey or anything else in the follow-up email, please reach out to me here at our center, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I know we're gathered here virtually today, but <clears throat> we at the center would like to take this time to acknowledge the land and pay respects to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken. <clears throat> Please take a few moments to read through this land acknowledgement, which was created by three members of our team here at our center, Ella and Keely Driscoll and our co-director, Sean Baer. Thank you. We will keep you muted for the duration of the webinar today. Please use the chat box feature if you have any questions or comments. And I'll try and keep an eye on that. And we should have a little time at the end of uh, um, Avis's uh, presentation to have discussion or if you have any comments, thoughts, feedback, questions please feel free to post those in the chat, or you can unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask those questions directly to, to uh, Dr. Garcia. So uh, I wanna now introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Avis Garcia. She is an enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho tribe and is affiliated with the Eastern Shoshone tribes of the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. She is an LPC and an addictions uh, therapist she also holds a doctorate in counselor education and supervision um, with a specialty in substance use disorder treatment um, and, and working with uh, Native American populations. Davis works with individuals of all ages and does individual group couples and family therapy. She specializes in the treatment of substance use disorders and trauma. Her therapeutic approach is to privilege indigenous knowledge and draw on the strengths of individuals and families to promoting interge intergenerational healing through research and clinical work. Uh, Avis has a uh, many, many years of work in the field and she's very knowledgeable and we're really happy to have her as part of our uh, consultant team here at the University of Iowa. So I'm gonna take my screen down and if you can give me just a few moments, Avis, I'm going to get uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint up, uh, and then I'll be advancing uh, the slide. Okay. Thank you. So just give me one moment. I'm going to try and get those up. Again, happy to have everyone here. Uh, just give me one moment to get uh, the next slide show up. Avis, can you see that okay? Um, I have my slides up. Okay, that's I right. I can see yours. I can see yours now. Okay, and audience members, uh, everybody sees this okay? Just a couple people can give me a give me a quick. Uh, I'm seeing your screen. It looks like. Oh, you're not seeing the. Unless the, okay, wait, 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 wait. Are you seeing the presentation screen? Let's see if we can hear from the audience. Yes. Yep. Amanda says uh, yes. And Kristen says yes. So we're good to go. Okay. This is great. So we're, Avis, we're on the slide that says clinical evaluation assessment. Okay. That's where I'm at. Okay. Wonderful. The floor is yours. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here in Billings, Montana this morning doing a training here. 
and I am presently uh, working as the director of the Crow Recovery Center and Crow Agency. So I have some of my staff with me at the training that we're attending here in Billings. And I'll go on ahead and get started. Today we will be covering clinical evaluation and assessment goals. So to start off, I will define the assessment process, identify assessment instruments, define DSM-5 criteria for substance abuse and dependence specifiers and multi-axial assessment, describe ASAM levels of care and diagnostic and dimensional criteria. Next slide. What is assessment? Assessment is the systematic process of interaction with an individual to observe, elicit, and subsequently assemble the relevant information required to deal with his or her case, both immediately and in the foreseeable future. This information gathering and interaction with the patient is a collaborative process as a clinical building block for everything we do moving forward with an initial assessment, we are, without an initial assessment, we are flying blind. The purpose of screening is to determine whether the individual needs an assessment. That's the purpose of screening. The purpose of assessment is to gather detailed information to determine if this person needs treatment. And in that case, a treatment plan would need to be developed to meet that individual's needs. The process is a sequential assessment process beginning with screening. Some medical facilities, I know uh, Indian Health Services has been using the SBIRT and doing screening and often referring uh, patients of theirs to the recovery service programs because they're seeing alcohol-related health problems or accidents and anything that might involve substance abuse. So they've been doing a good job of screening and sending referrals our way. Screening is the process of evaluating possible presence of a particular problem. The outcome is normally gathered by a simple yes or no. Then we look at the problem assessment. So we need to look at what, what problems are going on in the individual's life. Assessment is the process of defining that issue, determining a diagnosis, and developing specific recommendations and an individualized treatment plan to address the issues or diagnosis, and also a personal assessment. The next slide, if you look at the diagram on the left-hand side, you can see that it starts with the screening at the very bottom, and then it goes up to the problem assessment and up to the personal assessment. So screening takes less time, less money, and then as you see the price and the time goes up, the more involved we are in the screening process. The extent of information versus the cost. Sequential assessment, as one moves to, from screening to problem assessment to personal assessment, the extent of information developed is greater, but the cost of assessment are also greater. Performing an assessment sequentially ensures that further information is necessary and justifies its increased cost. Next slide. A multidimensional assessment is an initial step to ensure that the patient meets the level of care by gathering the patient's medical history, such as previous treatments, any current therapies, or prior use. This includes medical, behavioral, social, and financial. Use, what are they using? the amounts, how long have they been using it, age of use, how often are they using, looking at signs and symptoms, such as blackouts, brownouts, meetings, social and familial and work 
obligations? So are they meeting their day-to-day -day responsibilities in life? Looking at consequences such as arguments, losing jobs, cultural loss, spiritual loss, and education loss. This establishes the severity of the identified problem as mild, moderate, intermediate, or severe, determining the appropriate level of care and guides the treatment planning, relapse potential or continued use potential. So we are looking at these three dimensions, the use of drugs and alcohol, signs and symptoms of alcohol and drug use, and the consequences of their use. The content of screening begins with a brief process that answers two questions, whether or not an alcohol or drug problem is present, and if so, whether it is likely to require brief intervention or specialized treatment. Okay, we have a quiz question here. Is this question true or false? Collateral information when assessing a patient's needs is rarely required to determine an accurate diagnosis. Would this be true or false? Okay, the answer is false. Collateral information is vital to help in determining a diagnosis and course of treatment. So oftentimes our patients are referred to us by court systems, uh, maybe social service programs, maybe their employer. I know lately the uh, Crow Tribe has been doing random UAs and our business is really picked up because of that. So um, that is one big referral that we have that's been keeping our small agency very busy lately. Content of problem assessment. This examines problems attributable to alcohol or drug consumption. Retrospective is the past, what led to what is happening now, the prospective future, which includes the possible outcomes. We would look at lab results such as UAs, breathalyzers, swabs, all determined by time and specific hours. Oh, sorry, specific factors. Three techniques available are retrospective, prospective, and laboratory determination. So we just covered those. Content of problem assessment, signs and symptoms of alcohol and our drug use disorder. These are on pages 490 and 491 of the DSM-5. This is the big 11. This is the diagnostic criteria. This is what we're looking at. These make up the DSM-5 criteria and self-report questionnaires can also be used. Cross-referencing self-reports with collateral reports, such as arrest records. Um, when I used to work strictly for the criminal justice population, I often got what was known as their pre-sentence investigation report. So that would give me the rundown on number of times they've been arrested if they were usually on current probation or parole are looking at being sentenced into the prison system. So that gave me a good uh, reality check for the individual that was being assessed at that time. So there are 11 criteria that are used to determine the substance use disorder severity. Another common diagnosis for substance use disorders is unspecified such as an alcohol-related disorder, which is an F1099 as the ICD code. And that would be maybe somebody just um, got a DUI one night and they haven't drank in a long time. And you know, I like to think sometimes people just make a mistake and hopefully they learn from that. So this person may not warrant any treatment and you know, therefore we would go with an unspecified disorder. Alcohol equivalencies and drinking, remember that the amounts do matter. 
one drink is not a large bottle or a man can of beer, you know, the big 40 ounces. Um, I, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a stepson who's like over six feet something tall and he's a big, big guy. And for him, a, a beer might have been a whole pitcher of beer. So we have to be specific on, well, how much is that? Like how big of a drink are you having? And a lot of people don't realize when they go to bars that some of these mixed drinks that they're ordering may have several shots of liquor in them. So a lot of people aren't even aware of that. Like they may assume that one drink that they're having that has three or four shots of liquor in it is actually four drinks combined into one. So oftentimes when I do uh, classes or groups, I will point this out to the patients so that they have a better understanding of just how much alcohol they're actually consuming. This is important when you're doing your assessment because you want to know, is this person a heavy drinker or is this something they don't do very often and maybe they actually do have a glass of wine or a beer or two, um, if we look at the, the measurements. The content of problem assessment, consequences of alcohol and or drug use. Some examples that could be used as questionnaires could be the MAST, the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test, the DAST, the Drug Abuse Screening Test, now called Drug Use Questionnaire, an Alcohol Use Inventory, Alcohol Use Disorder Identification Test, known as the Audit, and then the one that's commonly used in Wyoming and Indian Country, if you're using AccuCare, the Addiction Severity Index is built right in. So this is what we use in Wyoming. The ASI has to be done to be considered a reliable substance abuse evaluation. So that's just some information I thought I'd throw in there. Content of personal assessment examines problems to determine if they are attributable to use. What's their medical status? Are they having any issues that are related to their alcohol use? Um, if you get lab results, there maybe their liver enzymes are high for cirrhosis or other possible medical problems. I've often seen people that I've done evaluations on that have diabetes or they have high blood pressure or they have heart problems. And just knowing that Regardless of having these medical problems, their continued use can be detrimental to their health. Their, what's their psychiatric status? Do we have somebody who has some mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, are they bipolar? Are, you know, do they have schizophrenia? So these things are also red flags for me if they do have, an, they are aware they have a psychiatric condition, but yet, they're still using, maybe they're not taking their medication. If prescribed medications, what were they taken? Usually most patients can ramble off to me exactly what they were taking because a majority of the time they decided to cope with their own self-medication, which leads to further problems. Any possible vocational issues? How are things going at work? Are they having trouble on the job? Did their job refer them? Any personal problems or, you know, is their family situation not so good because of their drinking? Any sexual problems? How about their social support? When things get really bad, they burn a lot of bridges. What's the family structure like? And what is their need for recovery support? Do they have somebody who can support them? Next is the content of personal assessment. This is where they come from, population and communities. So we would wanna look at what is use of their leisure time? Do they participate in any exercise? What are the demographics? What's their family history of, you know, do they come from generations of substance use, mental health disorders, trauma? Any prior treatment history? Have they gone to any other treatment programs? Did they successfully complete? where, how long, and looking at their level of intelligence. Does this person have any reading difficulties? Any other educational issues we need to be aware of? 
How is their cognitive functioning? What is their personality like? Treat, what are their treatment goals? You know, I like to ask them if they had a couple of goals that they wanted to work on, what do they think they need the most help with? What is their social stability? What are their situational factors? And then of course we have spirituality. And if you're using the ASI in the AccuCare system, there is a Native American assessment that I like to use because it does a good job of assessing the level of cultural identification from uh, more mainstream to being more traditional because a lot of uh, tribal recovery programs now try to provide specific cultural services as part of their treatment programming now. So when we're looking at cognitive functioning, you want to look at their reasoning, their memory, their attention. Sometimes we get people that say they don't even remember what happened. Uh, so that's a clear indicator of they are using to the point of blackout. And looking at their language and lead directly to the attainment of information, thus knowledge. Next, we will do an overview of the assessment process. This is a six step process of detection, classification, functional assessment, a functional analysis, treatment planning, and looking at recovery capital. This is the action or process of classifying something according to shared qualities or characteristics. The classifying, grouping, and ranking. This is an approach to figuring out reasons an individual behaves in certain ways. So we might look at their resources, social, physical, human, cultural, and spiritual, which are necessary to begin and maintain recovery. A lot of times if you're working with the Native American population, this cultural and spiritual aspect may be gone. They know that using has no place in that environment. So uh, they may have expressed an interest to be involved in that. So this is a good time to get them involved if they're interested. Recovery capital is the depth and breadth of internal and external resources that can be used by someone to begin and sustain wellness from addiction. So what does that look like for that individual? Drug testing. We have a question. What is the most common form of drug screening test performed in most substance abuse treatment centers in the US? Is it saliva testing, blood testing, urine analysis, or a sweat patch? And the answer is C, urinalysis, often abbreviated as UAs. It's pretty common, that's what we use. Detection, this is observable issues that indicate active use. Are they shaking? Are they having difficulty concentrating? Looking at this, if the patient is coming off of alcohol, they may feel very alert, while substances such as meth, they may be very tired. Can you smell any substances? Uh, I recently just ordered a breathalyzer and my kids always said, I have a nose that knows because I sometimes I, I, I've smelled stuff just before I ran groups or any of my staff have ran groups and they've been able to give them a breathalyzer and I'll be like, oh, I was right. I thought I smelled something. So some people struggle a great deal and they can't even like not use to come to group. So that's another point to reassess that individual and if they're in the right level of care. So detection identifies patients with a potential problem, past and current use of alcohol, tobacco, or other substances. Lab tests can be used to screen for substance use. We use um, a laboratory in California for most of our UAs that we do. The only drawback to that is we're often waiting at least a week for the results to come through. And then also 
ne any negative consequences. Classification, assess possible DSM diagnosis. The DSM can be also used to rule out a substance use disorder. We wanna rate the worst period of use, use multiple sources of information. So that's why I like the ASI is it gives you a real comprehensive assessment of that individual looking at six different areas of their life. Collateral information is key to making an informed, accurate, and objective classification, such as the substance use disorder diagnosis. A functional assessment is used to obtain patient information, use all available collateral resources, assess the patient's range of different needs, identify their strengths, their support system, and identify recovery capital. Strengths can be of use to get patients to remain on track. Culture is seen as a strength and as a prevention tool. So one of the tools that we're required to use now because of CARF accreditation is called the SNAP. This needs to be included in the assessment. So the S would stand for the strengths. The N is the needs. What needs does this person have? their, um, what are their abilities? What are some things that they do really well without having to work hard at? Maybe they're organized or they're hardworking or you know, they, maybe these people are educated. Anything that could be something that would help them. And then P is their preferences. So that's them being able to voice what type of treatment they would like. Um, if they're gonna get an individual therapist, do they want a male, do they want a female? So, um, I just thought I would add that because I'm working on a CARF accreditation right now. Oops, back up. Okay, the next one is the functional analysis. We wanna look at family, friends, home environment, leisure, such as watching games with friends who use. The game itself may become attributed with use. Some people watch sports or play sports that involves substance use. We would also wanna be looking at depression. Uh, alcohol is a depressant, so it can actually make things worse. Has there been a recent breakup? Did they just get divorced? Did you know, loss of a loved one? Reliance upon a crutch or coping tool like this may lead to consequences. Identify factors that maintain substance abuse, explore possible motives, view identified motives and costs as working hypotheses, not facts. Methods of obtaining assessment information, we would use preferably a face-to-face -face interview, semi-structured interview and a structured interview, paper and pencil tests and computerized assessments. Face-to-face -face allows for the use of micro-counseling skills. So you wanna be looking at body language, posture, are they crossing arms? Are they sitting up straight? How about their gestures? Are they using their hands a lot? How's their facial exp expression? Do they look angry? Do they look like they're a little nervous? And possibly eye movements. And yesterday somebody had mentioned and I see this a lot, especially in the counseling profession, because uh, when they look at multicultural counseling, I often read when people are referencing working with Native Americans that many do not have that direct eye to eye contact. And I have had patients that did not look at me at all. And being Native myself, I also know that just because I'm not looking at you doesn't mean I'm not listening to you. So not to uh, mistake their lack of direct eye contact as something of they're not paying attention or you know they're just tuning you out because a majority of the time we are listening. It's just a different, different way. We, we do things differently. You are gathering a comprehensive information. You must try to stay objective and on task during the assessment process. So keep things moving. I often have people that want to give a story for every question that's asked. So you have to work at uh, 
keeping them moving and letting them know we just need to get the answers and you know we can talk more about you know whatever they wanted to share later okay now to look at some assessment tools the asi um, has to be the most comprehensive from my viewpoint i prefer this it is a semi-structured interview that assess medical status employment and support drug use alcohol use their legal status their family social status and it also looks at the psychiatric status and they also have a few questions in there i believe four or five that looks at trauma that are really good flags to uh, pay special attention to and as i said the asi is exclusive to the acucare system in the indian health services a comprehensive drinking profile a cdp is a structured intake interview it looks at the history and current status of drinking problems and related manners, consumption and problematic behaviors. Then there is the timeline follow back, TLFB. Using a calendar or common holidays or seasons can also be effective means to establish an accurate timeline, such as temporal anchors. So we would want to be analyzing their patterns, the intensity and the frequency. Is this person drinking every day, all day? Are they a binge drinker? Maybe they're sober and clean for a month, two. And when they do drink or use, they do so for an extended period of time and heavily. Connections between use and significant events established. So some people may use specific holidays or specific social events, weddings, graduations, certain things as a reason to engage in substance use. We also have the inventory of drinking situations next, the IDS, which assesses situations of heavy drinking. It examines eight categories looking at negative emotional states, urges and temptations, negative physical states. Are there any personal conflict? Are they having problems with their family, with other people that's not in their family? Looking at positive emotional states, looking at the social pressure to drink, testing personal control and positive social situations. The next one is situational confidence questionnaire. It is a self-report instrument. So this is something you can hand off to the patient. Maybe you can put this in the intake packet and have them fill it out. Patients imagine themselves in each situation, rating themselves on a scale of zero to 100, of zero being not confident to 100, very confident how likely they will be able to resist the urge to use heavily in that situation. So we're looking at heavy use here. Next is the SASI. It is a substance abuse subtle screening inventory. And as I've gone on throughout my years of working in the addiction field, I've tended to just kind of toss this one out. Um, not to say that it's not any good or that it's not reliable. I just feel that we sometimes inundate our patients with a lot of information. And this is known as the SASI. It is, um, has a resistance to faking. So it can give you a pattern to let you know if the person was answering the questions truthfully or not. And it can also give you an idea of this person is at a high risk for a substance use disorder based on how they ask the questions. Next is the GAIN, Global Appraisal of Individual Needs. I know Wyoming was using this for adolescents and it was very in-depth and very lengthy. I don't can't say if it's still being used or not but it does look at eight core sections. And like I said, it, it, was, it was pretty in-depth and very time consuming, which is why I preferred to use the adolescent ASI. Um, it looks at their background, their substance use, their physical health, 
their risk behaviors, their mental health, their environment, legal, and vocational situation. Looking at the DSM-5, substance-related disorders in the DSM-5 chapter on substance-related and addictive disorders includes 10 substance-related disorders. We have alcohol-related, caffeine-related, cannabis-related, hallucinogen-related, inhalant-related, opioid-related, sedative, hypnotic, and anxiolytic-related disorders, stimulant disorders, tobacco-related, and other substance-related disorders. Another polling question. How many diagnostic criteria are listed in the DSM-5 in the section for substance use disorders? A, nine, B, 11, C, eight, or D, none of the above? What? is the answer. Okay, for those of you that guessed B11, you're right. There are 11 criteria in the DSM-5 that are used to determine whether or not an individual has a substance use disorder or not. Substance use disorders Almost all substance-related disorders in the DSM-5 include substance use disorders, substance intoxication, and substance withdrawal. Almost all specify that the substance use disorder be rated as mild, moderate, or severe. So those that would be the exception are caffeine, hallucinogen use, inhalant use, and tobacco use. Alcohol-related disorders include alcohol use disorders as mild, moderate, or severe, alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal, and unspecified alcohol-related disorder. So in the little side note, the distinction between alcohol abuse and dependence has been eliminated in the DSM-5. In the DSM-4, we did diagnosed as someone being a substance abuse or substance dependent, and we no longer do that anymore. We classify them as mild, moderate, or severe based on the number of criteria that they meet. If a patient has a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder, moderate, this is moderate, how many DSM-5 criteria would they need to currently meet? A, three to four, B4, C5, A, B, and C. And those that guessed the answer D, that is correct. Answer D would be B and C, so it would be four to five. Alcohol use disorder. If you look at this scale here, we have a mild alcohol use disorder reflects the presence of two to three symptoms. A moderate alcohol use disorder is the presence of four to five. And someone with a severe alcohol use disorder would have six or more present because there are 11. And we do get those that you can check all the boxes. Alcohol use disorder is a problematic pattern of alcohol use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by at least two of 11 listed symptoms occurring within a 12 month period. Symptoms of alcohol use disorder. One, often taking alcohol in larger amounts over a longer period than they in intended. For example, in quotes here, it says, even when I go out to a bar or a party, having resolved to drink no more than three beers or spend no more than two hours, by the end of the evening, I discover I've consumed 10 beers over four hours. Two, a persistent desire un or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control alcohol use 
time and again, I've tried to control my drinking, but I've never been able to do so. Number three, spending a great deal of time in activities necessary to obtain alcohol, use alcohol or to recover from its effects. Alcohol takes up a lot of time in my life. What with getting the money to buy it, spending time at bars, consuming it, and talking to friends and then getting over whatever hangover I might have developed from my drinking. Next is the symptoms of alcohol use disorder. Four can include craving or strong desire or urge to use alcohol. This is a new symptom that was added. When I haven't been drinking for a day or two, I'll begin to experience a strong craving for alcohol, which stays with me until I have a drink to get rid of the craving. Five, recurrent alcohol use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. It will sometimes happen that my drinking makes it impossible for me to do my work or take care of my family. This makes me feel terrible, but I still do it why so sometimes they're even questioning themselves more symptoms of alcohol use disorder continued alcohol use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of alcohol even though i have a tendency to become angry and sometimes violent when i've been drinking i continue to drink and then I suffer the consequences of my anger and fights. Seven, important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of alcohol use. I used to like to dance and visit with my friends and family, but since I started drinking so much, I've given up almost everything that doesn't involve drinking. Eight, recurrent alcohol use in situations where it is physically hazardous. I've had three OWIs and have been in two accidents because of my drinking in which I was pretty seriously injured. But every time I can drive, I've been drinking. And those of you that do the DUI classes, you'll hear all the stories that people have, different stories. Tolerance is defined by either of the following, A, a need for markedly increased amounts of alcohol to achieve intoxication or the desired effect, B, a markedly diminished effect with continued use of the same amount of alcohol. So they either start drinking more or they switch up to uh, alcohol that has a higher uh, alcohol content. Next is a symptom, more symptoms, number nine, Alcohol use is continued despite knowledge of having persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by alcohol. Even though I almost always get very depressed after I've been drinking for some time, I still continue to drink. I don't know why, it doesn't make any sense. So it just makes depression a lot worse. Any emotional uh, disorder they may be struggling with is, is always made worse. It, it never makes it better. Symptoms of alcohol use disorder. We want to look at tolerance. 10 and 11, there is a need for markedly increased amounts of alcohol to achieve intoxication or the desired effect. 11, a markedly diminished effect. Looking at withdrawal, the characteristic withdrawal syndrome for alcohol, are 13 alcohol or closely related substance such as benzodiazepine is taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. Remember withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines can be life-threatening. Medical stabilization must be a priority. Benzos, tapers are also commonly used to manage acute alcohol withdrawal symptoms. DSM-5 simplified remission specifiers include early remission, patient not meeting any substance use criteria for at least three months, but less than 12, so that is early remission, 
The next is sustained remission, not meeting any substance use disorder criteria for at least 12 months. So there is early partial, early full, sustained partial, sustained full remission. All of that has been removed. Recovery-oriented systems of care. Thinking about the future in this field, I see a new trend that holds particular promise. That is the recent shift in thinking away from the clinical treatment model toward recovery and recovery-oriented systems of care. The shift is leading us to see recovery as less of an event and more as a process. The recovery paradigm invites us to move from a narrow focus on the deficits that accompany addiction to looking at the strengths that come with recovery. We focus less on pathology, more on wellness. We focus not only on recovery from addiction and its negative effects, but also the recovery of a meaningful life in the community. A recovery-oriented systems of care, a paradigm shift, shifts from the question of how do we get the patient into treatment to how do we support the process of recovery within the person's environment? A lot of times I, I know people have thought that everybody needs to go to a treatment center, but then over time, especially on the reservation where I come from, they were like, oh, once they come back, they just get right back into the same environment they were in, and there they go right back to the same problem they had. So now there, there's a lot more emphasis of doing outpatient treatment first to help them learn how to establish recovery within the environment that they have to deal with every day, which I think is more realistic. There we have another polling question. Which of the following is not a key component of the recovery-oriented system of care approach? A, various support systems need to work separately with the patient. B, builds on strengths and resilience of the patient. C, offers comprehensive menu of services that can be adjusted to meet the needs of the patient. And D, adjustable to the patient's pace and recovery process, which of the following is not a key component. And the correct answer is A, various support systems working separately with the patient is not a recovery oriented system of care. We need a system that's working together. Recovery-oriented systems of care, treatment agencies are considered one of many resources for the patient. No one source is more important than another. Various support systems need to work together very closely with the patient. Recovery-oriented systems of care support person-centered and self-directed approaches to care that build on the personal responsibility, strengths and resilience of individuals, families and communities to achieve health, wellness and recovery from substance related disorders. So if you look at the middle here, you look at the individual with their family and their community that looks at health, wellness and recovery. So an overall more holistic approach. Recovery-oriented systems of care offer a comprehensive menu of services and supports that can be combined and adjusted to meet the needs and chosen pathways to recovery. So if you look at the, the individual in the middle of this diagram and look at the service and supports here in the blue circle, we have family and child care, education, housing, transportation, spirituality, legal, financial, case management, vocational, HIV services, uh, peer support. I'm thinking this VSO, is this victim services offices, Steve? PTSD and mental health, healthcare, and of course the drug and alcohol treatment. So all these are things that the individual needs to help get their 
life. It was like, sorry, I was muted there. I, I think, I think so. I think it's uh, victim services. Okay. But I'll double check. Okay. Uh, maybe somebody from I just the audience need that. I'm that. just assuming. <laughs> Uh, maybe somebody from the audience recognizes that acronym. I, I think it is, though. Uh, okay. I think it is victim services. More on recovery oriented systems of care. We, these are person centered. This lets the patient take the lead in their program and self directed. So this gives them some choice and, and it allows them to build trust in being able to have a voice in what their recovery program is going to look like for themselves which looks at their strengths and resilience in the patient, involving families and communities to take some responsibilities for their health, wellness, and recovery from mental illness, offers a comprehensive menu of services that can be adjusted to meet the needs of the patient, adjustable to the patient's pace and recovery process. So everybody is different. So not one program is meant to be cookie cutter for a specified amount of time for each individual. Recovery oriented systems of care encompass and coordinate the operations of multiple systems, providing responsive outcomes, outcomes driven approaches to care, require an ongoing process of systems improvement that incorporates the experiences of those in recovery and their family members. So for example, peer support specialists are being used more and more in the recovery programs, effect on our involvement in the assessment process. The patient is an equal partner in the assessment process. So it's not us dictating or putting ourselves above, which is more in line with native cultural, how we live our life. I was always taught I never put myself above people that I put myself on the same level as, as everyone else to be more humble. Elements of recovery oriented systems of care. Again, this is person centered. I'm, I'm all about CARF right now and CARF requires that my agency provide services that are person centered. So they're individualized, responsive to the culture and personal beliefs of that individual community-based commitment to peer services. So we do have peer specialists, involvement of families and other allies. So this would be having maybe once a month, you have a couple of family days and you do some family activities and ongoing monitoring and outreach. Next, more on the recovery oriented systems of care. They are cost-effective, outcome-oriented, integration of services resulting in no duplication, competency-based, effective use of collaborators and partners, system-wide education and training, a continuum of care, they are research-based and also have flexible funding. Next is the ASAM criteria, dimensions, risk ratings, and levels of care. This is an acronym for the American Society of Addiction Medicine. The polling question, what does ASAM stand for? A you just, you just gave I this just to told me. You. So just everybody gave should get this right. Attention. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was a freebie, Avis. I think freebie. Everybody should All get this. All righty. <laughs> well, let's skip that one then. We need to do flip that around, Steve. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm making a note of that. Thank you. Or move it further out. Anyway. I, I know. I, <laughs> Back to American the Society of Addiction. Yeah. Okay. The answer is C. Yes. We Around 1981, N A A T P. The National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers and ASAM assemble task force to integrate two existing admission continued stay criteria sets. One was the Cleveland criteria. The next one was the NAATP criteria, and they decided to relinquish any ownership branding of the criteria. So this became better known as the goal of the ASAM criteria to unify the addiction field around a single set of criteria 
so we could all have the same language and all be on the same page and not be back and forth. The ASAM criteria includes different levels of care. So we have 0 0.05 through four with 0 0.5 being your early intervention, which could be pre-treatment, early intervention services, basic education, risk assessment, screening, uh, DUI class, uh, minor in possession class, uh, level one to 2.1 is outpatient treatment, which can include extended outpatient treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, and continuing care outpatient. Level two five would include partial hospitalization. So we have somebody here who has some medical or psychiatric problems that requires some minimal treatment. And then we have the residential inpatient treatment, which ranges anywhere from level three one, three five, three three, four, and three seven. These are your low intensity residential treatments medium intensity residential treatments. Basically, the higher the number, the more intense the services are. Uh, looking at medically monitored intensive, sometimes we have patients that are already in early to late stages of cirrhosis. And we also have detoxification. And we have the opioid treatment programs now, which are a level one often provided on an outpatient basis in combination with some medication management. The ASAM criteria has six dimensions. The dimension one is looking at into acute intoxication and our withdrawal. Dimension two is looking at biomedical conditions and complications, so how is their health? Dimension three, emotional, behavioral, cognitive conditions and complications. Dimension four, readiness to change. Dimension five, relapse, continued use or continued problem potential. And dimension six is looking at their recovery and living environment. Do they have a stable living environment or is this person homeless? important to look at. The ASAM, which ASAM dimension is associated with determining a patient's willingness to engage in the treatment process? Dimension two, six, B6, C1, D4, or E, none of the above. Willingness, willingness to engage in treatment, which dimension is that going to be addressed in the ACM? The answer is D, dimension four. We're looking at the readiness to change. Are they in pre contemplation? <laughs> are they in the action stage? So, this is where are they in the, in the process? Risk ratings, zero to four AB scale. The ASAM risk rating system is based on a scale. This risk rating acts as a guide for clinicians, managed care providers, medical staff, and support staff. A rating of zero may indicate no concerns or stable condition in that given dimension. A rating of four A or four B may indicate a significant concern and the presence of an acute condition in that dimension. Risk ratings are based on direct observations, current patient information derived from multiple sources, as well as historical information from the patient's records and self-reports. When assigning a risk rating in each dimension, remember, it may not match word for word, just focus on selecting the risk rating that most accurately reflects the patient's condition for each dimension at the time of the review assessment. 
risk rating are not static. They will change over time with a continued stay review, but the risk ratings at the time of your assessment will help you decide the best LOC level of care for the patient. Risk ratings for mental health disorders and substance use disorders are assigned separately in dimensions four, five, and six, but will often interact in and influence each other at the same time. Assessment and are throughout a patient's treatment stay. So while this person is in treatment, you want to do an ongoing assessment of are they in the right level of care? Or do we need to go higher or keep them where they're at? Move them down. Discharge, yeah. ASAM criteria, the six dimensions related risk ratings. So when we're looking at dimension one, acute intoxication and our withdrawal, zero, the patient is fully functioning, demonstrates good ability to tolerate and cope with withdrawal discomfort. No signs or symptoms of intoxication or withdrawal are present or the symptoms are resolving. One, the patient demonstrates adequate ability to tolerate and cope with withdrawal discomfort. Mild to moderate intoxication are signs and symptoms and interfere with daily function, but do not pose an imminent danger. Two, the patient has some difficulty tolerating and coping with withdrawal discomfort. So this gives you the, the risk rating uh, dimension. And then three and four, like we said, there's from zero to four rating in each dimension. So three would be the patient demonstrates poor ability to tolerate and cope with withdrawal discomfort. Severe signs and symptoms of intoxication indicate the patient may pose an imminent danger. Four, the patient is incapacitated, severe signs and symptoms, severe withdrawal presents danger such as seizures, continued use, so as you see, it gets more serious from zero to four. So some people have charts where you can actually go through and just circle these ratings for each dimension that that person meets. There's different forms that are used to do this. ASAM criteria, six dimensions. Dimension two, biomedical conditions and complications. As I shared with you, we're rating them on a scale of zero to four. So zero could be they don't have any medical problems or you know they're not having any problems at all at this time. One patient has the ability to manage the mild discomfort. It doesn't interfere with their functioning. Two, the patient might have some difficulty and they might interfere with the recovery, but they're not life-threatening medical problems that the, they're probably, maybe they're already seeing a physician for whatever medical problems they might have. But it, it is good to assess that part of them. And then three and four in this biomedical conditions and complications, like I said, the risk rating, the higher the number, three and four, that's when it's getting more severe and we're probably looking at a higher level of care for that individual. So three would be they have poor ability to tolerate and cope with their physical problems. Uh, maybe they don't follow their medical problems, taking their medication or they have you know, some serious medical problems. Four, the patient is incapacitated, severe medical problems, severe pain, uncontrolled diabetes, GI bleeding, uh, advanced stage cirrhosis. So there are a lot of situations that determines where are we going to take this patient for the proper care that they need. 67, looking at dimension three, emotional behavioral cognitive conditions. And I could probably talk all day about this ASAM criteria, but just to keep it brief and looking at the time here. So this dimension three is emotional, behavioral, and cognitive conditions. Like we said, these slides will be available. So if you want to go back through these and look at these risk ratings, we're rating them from zero to four with zero. Basically, there's no problems there. One, they might have something that needs some atten attention, but it's not going to interfere with their treatment programming. And two, Maybe there is something there, but they're getting, you know, they're being treated for it. 
maybe they're seeing a counselor and are on psychotropic medication for that problem. Going deeper in three and four, there is, a, you know, the risk rating is getting more severe, but the patient is managing their condition, they're taking their medication, they have coping skills, and four, this is very severe. So when we're looking at fours, we're looking at the higher level of care for that individual. The ASAM criteria, dimension four is the readiness to change. So we're looking at zero. Patient is willingly engaged in treatment as proactive and responsible participant. Uh, one, the patient is willing to enter into treatment and explore for changing his or her use, substance use, but kind of not real sure. They're, they're on the fence of whether they think they really need and need to get any help or not. Avis, I've, I've went ahead and advanced us to the polling question slide. Okay. Uh, the, the ASAM criterion, uh, if you're using it currently, this is a good review. If your agency is not requiring the use of ASAM, it may be something that at some point you may want to familiarize yourself with, but it's a wonderful supplement to your primary assessment tool and can be used as a guide to help add some additional validity and, and uh, well, thank you for jumping ahead on that. And if you get yes. the ASAM book, the big blue book for adults yes. and adolescents, they have a crosswalk. Yes. There's pages That's in exactly there that you right. open yeah. and it has all the dimensions and the levels of severity so that you're able to like, okay, this person meets this, this, and this, and you're able to put that wording in. Or some agencies have the form, like I said, that is easy yeah. to fill out quickly. Yeah. If anyone's interested, I have some good quick reference forms I'd be willing to share. So okay. you can email me and I'll, I'll send them your way. All righty, thank you. Okay, levels of care. Like I said, point five is early intervention. This could be one-on-one -on -one counseling, educational programs. Patients don't meet the criteria for a substance-related disorder. Problems and dimensions one, two, or three are stable are being addressed. Then we have level one outpatient treatment, individual group counseling, motivational enhancement, opioid substitution, family, education groups, psychotherapy, other therapies, usually a real low level programming, I would say. For my own might be 10 sessions with that individual or 10 groups, depending, different states have different standards. I mean, I've gone from Wyoming that I thought was mild compared to Colorado to get to Montana to be like, you guys don't even do as much as Wyoming does. So I've seen these differences <laughs> from where I'm located. Uh, level one outpatient dimensional admission. So again, this is the ASAM criteria. It lets you know if this person is level one, and one, two, and three, the criteria that are met for that level of care. And- Which, uh, which slide are you on now? I, I think we need to get- I'm our on 87. Okay, I, I'm, I can't see my slide numbers. Which, okay. uh, which- Level one outpatient dimensional admission, dimension four and dimension five. Mm. Have we done the uh, have we done the polling question already? Oh yes, that looks like a really yeah. You did the polling question. Yeah. I thought I must have gone the wrong way. Okay. Well, maybe I'm, I'm sorry, folks. I just uh, I think I got, I think I got off on the slide. Sorry about that, Avis. I was trying to push us through, and I know I'm looking at the clock. It's twelve fifteen now, so we've got like fifteen more hang. minutes, and that's why yeah. I'm referring the viewers to check your ASAM manual. I believe you can Google a crosswalk form that will basically lay out all the levels of care and dimensions all in one. 
I'm just going to get us, I'm going to try and get us where we need to be. So, okay. Bear, bear with me, folks. I'm, for some reason, I'm having a hard time. I may be having connectivity issues too with this because it seems to have skipped over some of my slides here. So sorry, folks. This must be the, this must be the Montana effect going on here. Okay. Now I'm going to get us there. You, Avis, you said slide 87. Yes. Oh. And just to sum it up, I, again, I'm referring to the crosswalk for ASAM placement. Yeah, I'm going to get us there. So sorry, for, folks. And for those of you that are already working in treatment programs, which I'm going to assume many of you are that are watching today, you know this ASAM criteria. Yes, that's under right. Different levels. So if you're studying for the exam, you would want to, you know, have an idea of what each level of care we'd be looking at. Okay, I think we're back on here. Okay. The big sky effect. Yes, that's right, Kevin. This is the big sky effect that's happening. The big sky effect? The big sky effect. Kevin was, he was joking around with me on that. I, I oh. said Montana effect. And okay. Are, are you on a different slide number than I am? I'm on 87. It says level one outpatient treatment dimensional admission criteria. Okay. Well, now I got to back up. So you tell me uh, where to go. Just have me, just ask me to advance your slides each time we get there, so. Okay. Well, we're still on level one, which is okay. the low level treatment. So their scores on dimension four and five are gonna be in the low numbers. Yes. Like I said, the higher the number, the higher the level of treatment that they're gonna need. Thank you. And a lot of times when you're determining what level of care they need to go in, because there are six dimensions, I've always gone, if they meet like three right on in that area is, is generally the level of care you're leaning towards. But the more serious the problems, if they're scoring fours, we're probably looking at the higher level of care. Would be good if we were able to have that some slide in here that shows the the form to give an idea of what that crosswalk looks like just for future reference i'm on 87 i'm going to jump ahead to 89 on to 89 we're still looking at level one and i'm on 90 we're an intensive outpatient so dimension one, they're not having any withdrawal signs or symptoms. They're able to cope and manage well with any discomfort. Dimension two, medical conditions are stable, are monitored. Like I said, they may be already under physician's care for whatever medical problems they may be presenting with. Uh, dimension three, an intensive outpatient, there may be persistent mental health problems and symptoms, but they're not going to pose a problem for treatment. Uh, or they could be diagnosed with severe emotional, behavioral, or cognitive disorder that doesn't require them to be confined to a, any other residential programming. Dimension four, uh, they could be reluctant to treatment, low commitment to change, inconsistent follow through, Minimal awareness of their substance disorder, might not see the need to change, and maybe unwilling to follow through. So some of these people, if you don't have any leverage, it makes it hard to keep them engaged. Remember, these are just guidelines to assist you in making the best treatment recommendation during the assessment process. There will always be exceptions to the guidelines, so you always want to consult with your supervisor. So. If you're preparing for the exam, I'm going to assume you're under someone who's supervising you that has that uh, level of expertise to guide you through this uh, review. 
Dimensions five and six in intensive outpatient treatment. Symptoms may be intensifying in dimension five and functioning may be deteriorating at a lower level of care. So maybe, you know, we tried to get them into an, a level one group and they still were still having some problems. So we're going to bump them up to a little bit more. They may have impaired recognition, recognition and understanding of relapse issues, uh, you know, might not have any coping skills and need to learn some little recognition to understand substance abuse relapse issues. Again, no skills. Dimension six, we're looking at the environment. Are they in a supportive environment or a non-supportive environment? Maybe they have an unstable environment. You know, maybe they have nowhere to go, which also is, is very difficult to help people in that situation. Moving up to level three, five, residential admission criteria. This is where they're having much more severe problems. There is a minimal risk of severe uh, withdrawal or maybe severe but manageable in a, with detox services. Dimension two, their medical conditions, they might not have any are receiving medical care already or their medical condition is manageable. Continued in three, five residential, dimension three, repeated inability to control impulses. Psychiatric disorder requires a higher structure to manage their behavior. Dimension four, readiness to change. They might not be able to follow through, have no awareness of their problems. They're not in danger to anyone or anyone else. Unwilling to explore change unable to follow through with treatment recommendations. Um, behavior presents as imminent danger to self or others, unable to function independently and engage in self-care. So this person's reached a point where they need to be in a structured environment, controlled environment 24 seven. Dimension five, no recognition of skills needed to prevent continued use with dangerous consequences, repeated treatment episodes. Dimension six, they only have to have A or B, so not both, just one of these. That is looking at the environment, is unsupportive or hostile, toxic to recovery, unable to cope with negative effects of their environment, and non-supportive client lives with a drug dealer who offers drugs daily. So that's like pretty serious that you do need to get that person out of there. Withdrawal management overview, components of withdrawal management services, levels one, two, three, two, three, seven, and four are provided as part of a continuum of five withdrawal management levels in the ASAM. Withdrawal management criteria includes a continuum of care that ensures patients can enter substance use disorder treatment at a level appropriate to their needs to step them up or down or to different intensity of treatment levels. Withdrawal management continued looking at intake, the process of admitting the patient into a substance use disorder treatment program this includes the substance abuse evaluation, the diagnosis of a substance use disorder, assessment of treatment needs, which may include physical examination and our laboratory testing, observation, the process of monitoring the patient's course of withdrawal as frequently deemed medically appropriate. This may include, but not limited to observation of the patient's health status. So when I worked in a, a, a detox center, we took their vitals every hour. We were doing their blood pressure. We were doing their pulse. We were checking their blood alcohol content or if it was drugs, you know, we, were, we, were, we would use what was called the CWA. And then the medication services, the prescription of administrative administration related to substance use disorder treatment services and are the assessment to the side effects and results of that medication. 
meaning you probably need to have a nurse on hand. And discharge services, preparing the patient for referral into another level of care. So when I was in a detox, sometimes we were looking at helping people get into treatment right from there, those that needed it. Post-treatment return, our re-entry into the community, and are the linkage of the individual to community treatment, housing, and human services. Again, that recovery-oriented systems of care comes into play. Withdrawal and management, there are licensing and certification requirements. In order to provide withdrawal management detoxification, service providers must obtain specific licensing and certification requirements according to the level of care provided. So there is training involved, depending on what environment you enter into to provide services. One more polling question. If a patient has at least one risk rating of three, which level of treatment care should be considered? A, 2.1 intensive outpatient, B, extended level one, extended outpatient, C, level three, five, residential, D, level 0 0.05, early intervention. So a risk rating of three. And that says at least one. So that would be intensive outpatient, it looks like, is the answer. Answer is A. A SAM risk rating guidelines are as follows. The risk rating zero to one is 0.5. Early intervention services are level one continuing care. Risk rating one to two equals level one outpatient. Risk rating two or three is equivalent to a 2.1. Risk rating three or four would fall into residential three, five. The risk rating can assist the evaluator in making consistent, accurate, and objective decisions about patient's level of care and related treatment services. Again, there's always exceptions to the guidelines. So I would be looking to supervision to help you with additional insight and determining patient needs. This is usually what your clinical staffings are for, so the team can discuss and plan for that individual. Clinical evaluation assessment summary, again, includes the assessment process, assessment instruments, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria is looked at, and the ASAM levels of care. Where does this person need to go based on your assessment and diagnosis of that individual? What's gonna be most appropriate? Any questions, comments, thoughts, ideas? I don't see the chat box. I'm not in control of that, so I'm missing something. Well, that's a lot of information, and uh, I know I know some of it's a little confusing. If you've not been using ASAM or not required to, I know the ASAM can be a little bit daunting, but um, we'll we'll try and tighten that up a little bit uh, in future presentations to make it a little more understandable. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I saw a lot of. Uh, just acknowledgements, uh, thanking you for the, the great presentation, a lot of information. I tried to throw a few comments in there as we were going along and uh, really appreciate everyone's time and uh, attention today. And sorry for our little, our little slide mishap. Um, when one person's advancing the slides and the other one's lecturing, it can be a challenge. It's the, the, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, literally. <laughs> I, I really do want to appreciate everyone's time. We'll broadcast again uh, next month uh, for our next ESAS um, webinar, and we'll continue our discussion regarding uh, essential substance abuse skills training and topics related to that. So until then, I want to thank Avis Garcia for her lecture and presentation, and of course, to all of you listening in. Until next time, please uh, stay safe, stay connected, and uh, Stay healthy. Dr.